Okay, good morning, everyone. And um, as always, thank you for uh, thank you for joining. I'm just going to actually mute everyone besides myself. Um, please feel free to unmute yourselves as, as per the normal format. Um, I apologize, there's been a little bit of an interruption for several weeks, um, but we do have one uh, one share left on the subject of uh, um, shadim or demons in the Gemara. Um, so just maybe because there's been such a gap, um, just to summarize where we were up to in our, uh, in our uh, thinking about this topic, um, we saw several sources that um, speak about the concept of Shadim, demons. Um, this list was not uh, exhaustive, uh, but it gave us a sample of, uh, of, of some of the uh, Mara Nakoma, some of the main sources. Um, the earliest sources date back to a possible reading in the Pesukim. There's references to something called the Seirim, the um, goats or the goat-like creatures, um, both in, in Sefer Vayikra and in Sefer Devarim. And we saw uh, a range of Mutharshim, some of whom understand that this refers to Shadim, to um, along with idol worship, there was also an attempt to build a relationship with shade and with demons. And we saw already in the Mfarshim from Ibn Ezra and onwards, um, a discussion much, much like with magic as to whether this belief in demons reflects a genuine force, that there is such a force um, in existence as demons, or whether it refers to the, the crazed um, fantasies of pagan worship. And much like we don't, uh, according to uh, the Rambam and Ibn Ezra and others, we don't believe in magic. Similarly, Shadim, the reference in the Pesukim to Shadim doesn't determine their genuine existence, but merely, merely reflects a false belief that was prevalent at the time. But then we turn to the Gemara, and in the Gemara there are numerous references to Shadim. Some Gemaras are clearly or, or, or clearly open to interpretation as allegorical. Um, they speak about mysterious events that occur to people, and these may be meant as medrash to be understood not as uh, literal stories, but as some, referring to some sort of a mystical encounter with forces of evil. However, there are other Gemaras which seem to casually reference Shadim. Um, for example, the Gemara that speaks about a shade um, learning Torah in the base of Medrash and communicating Torah from one end of Bovel to the other end of Bovel. Um, it refers to casual uh, encounters with um, Shadim, where, where Shadim were used by Moran to inform them about various things going on, and even gives us the name of one of these Shadim, Yosef Shida. And as we discussed in previous weeks, um, this shade remarkably makes it into the archaeological record because amongst the list of um, various dignitaries on uh, Babylonian pottery, Jewish pottery, is Yosef Shida, Rav Yosef Shida, um, a rabbi Yosef Shida, who is, uh, according to the Gemara, some form of learned shade who um, learns Torah. So what, what are we meant to make of these references? So uh, we saw a range of sources. Um, we saw Rabbi Huda Chassid representing the school of the Hasidic Ashkenaz. Um, the, the works of the Hasidic Ashkenaz in general are full of demonology, of the fear of demons and the attempts that people can make to protect themselves from Shadim. And they take this um, literally and, and uh, um, as, as a phenomena within the natural world. Um, we saw a, uh, a Rambam and uh, other sources who understand shade to refer to a, a wild person, a, a uncontrollable person. This Rav Yosef Shida is referring to someone who indeed learns in the base of Medrash, but, but was demonic in his personality, in his behavior, because then on the Shabbos, he travels, he's Machal al Shabbos, to deliver the Divrei Torah to a base of Medrash at the other end of uh, Bovo. Um, so this is how the Rambam understands it. The Rambam speaks about the Medrash that describes Adam Harishan giving birth to Shadim to mean that Adam creates human beings who have no human culture and intelligence about them, but are wild um, people. These are humanoids, human-like creatures, biologically human, but don't reflect what we consider true humanity. This is how the Rambam in his Moron um, Avuchim understands it. The uh, Ge'onim and Rabbi Nuchmanel um, understand the demons to be referencing, at least in certain instances, um, the imagination of people, and indeed they seem critical of this imagination. They speak about it almost as a crazed imagination. They speak about Rav Bibi Barbaya, who is a great Amora, but in their version of the Gemara and the Gisa that they have, um, he, he, he loses his mind due to an over-obsession with trying to understand uh, forces of evil and Shadim and uh, um, over-engagement with them, and therefore what he says in this respect is not considered um, absolutely reliable. So a range of different approaches. 
Finally, I think at the end of the last year, I shared the thoughts of the MSD archive, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. So we're now leaving classic sources. All the sources I mentioned so far are from the Rishonim and the Gaonim. We're now going into the modern era. And he says, look, I understand that Shadim um, don't fit in with our current understanding of the world. We live in a very rational, scientific universe. And indeed, in this rational and scientific universe, Shadim don't exist. They are forces of evil that parallel forces of um, prophecy and spirituality. And as spirituality has declined and we've become more um, philosophical and more material, and he doesn't see this solely as an advantage, similarly, the forces of evil have declined and Shadim no longer exist. Um, and this is a, a possible theory, but then he continues and he says he believes this is what the Rambam meant, what the Rambam meant when the Rambam denies the existence of Shadim. This doesn't mean to say the Rambam doesn't uh, consider it Shadim to exist at all. The Rambam simply means to say they no longer exist in the modern, in the rational era of which the Rambam was a part. This reading in the Rambam doesn't seem to be tenable. The, um, the concept of Shadim um, and uh, belief in them uh, does not, the Raman does not seem to be saying this is simply a phenomenon of the modern era. He seems to be also learning Chazal in that way. The Raman doesn't seem to believe at all in this concept. And I think we concluded last time with a look at the Vilna Gaon, who indeed uh, wraps, nowadays we would say wraps the Raman on the knuckles, the Vilna Gaon wraps the Raman on his skull. Hikos al Kodkodo, the Raman was wrapped on the skull, he says, by many of the later commentaries who believe the Raman was over influenced by philosophy and a philosophical worldview. Um, but the Gaon takes it uh, as understood that the Rambam indeed denies the existence of Shadim. So this is a, a, an encyclopedic summary of the sources we've seen so far. Those who take Shadim literally, one school of thought, um, those who consider Shadim to refer to wild human beings and don't take it literally at all. Um, those who understand that Shadim are the figments of crazed imagination, whether pagan or even tragically on occasion great people. Um, and those who uh, consider Shadim to no longer exist, but once upon a time existed, um, and those who uh, um, say this is a reference uh, to wild uh, to, to, uh, to wild people, as we said, the view of the Ramam. Um, so a range of perspectives on this topic. I want to look at one final school of um, thought, um, which actually a couple of people have, have remarkably just texted me um, in, the, in the chat uh, along similar lines. Someone posted to me privately asking what we make of the story of Rav Yosef Cairo speaking to an angel readily when writing Shulchan Aruch. And someone else said, could the proposal of Yosef Shiddur not simply be saying, we don't know how. So in fact, we're now going to look at a school of thought that um, uh, goes with a, a sort of um, psychological perspective around these issues. Um, now, the first allusion to this idea is a Ma'iri. The Me'iri, again, is a, uh, um, a late, uh, relatively late Rishon from Provence in the south of France and a carrier of the tradition of the Rambam. Um, the Rambam who introduced uh, a very philosophical trend to Spain and to Spanish Jewry. Um, within Spain itself, in uh, the 13, late 1200s and 1300s, there was a considerable backlash against the school of the Rambam, and Spain began moving more towards mysticism, the leadership of the Rambam, Nachmanides, the students of the Rambam, the Rashba, and others, and Provence in South France carried the tradition, the philosophical tradition of the Rambam onwards. And the Me'iri um, is, is a carrier of this tradition and also a, an exceptionally prolific and important commentary on the Gemara. And the Me'iri is commenting on a halachic Gemara, which we looked at last time, in which the Gemara speaks about the reliability of testimony about a, an Arguna case. So um, one receives a testimony uh, about a, a woman who, um, uh, um, sorry, or an instruction, I should say, let me, let me back off that and say this more clearly, an instruction um, to write a get, a divorce document for a woman. And um, the, the witnesses uh, testify that they are convinced this was the voice of the husband instructing them to write the get, but they didn't see the individual himself. He was in a pit. He had uh, been put in a pit, perhaps it's referencing a prison or the like, and they hear a voice coming out, um, and they are sure this is the voice of the husband. And the question is, can they issue a get based upon that or not? And the one says, well, how do we know it's the husband? Maybe this is a shade. Maybe this is a demon who seems to have the ability to mimic the voices of people. And therefore, how can we rely on this instruction to write the get? Now, the Rambam, when he brings the Salacha, um, rewrites the Salacha and says, you can't rely on this because maybe this is indeed the voice of the husband, but maybe this is someone else. How do we know whose voice it is? The Me'iri puts this a little bit further and he says, maybe this is indeed the voice, but maybe this is an Irvuv Shal'eza Dimyon. Maybe this is a 
confusion of imagination. And here the Meiri is already uh, leading us towards thinking that maybe the concept of a shade is used as a way of expressing uh, uh, an element of psychology of, of a confusion of thought. And in a few moments, we'll see what, what's demonic about a confusion of thought. But this, this is how the Meiri reads this, um, this source. There's a number of Hasidic sources which go along a similar line. And that's not the purpose of my discussion today to um, speak too much about Hasidus. It'd be an interesting topic in its own right to discuss what Hasidus was and what exactly its innovations were. Um, but one uh, aspect of Hasidus, which is not spoken often enough about, is that whilst it is true they popularized Kabbalistic and mystical concepts, um, they also often psychologized these concepts and um, uh, took mystical ideas and tried to turn them inward focused as a sort of internal state of being and um, a sense of, of, um, of inner work. In other words, let's not leave this just as an abstract mystical concept, but let's try and understand what it tells us about human nature and our own inner workings um, and use that as a tool for self-improvement. And I want to share two sources with you today, um, and I, I could have chosen many, but these are just two sources that speak about the concept of Shadim in, in a very blatant and clear psychological manner in which they're referencing an inner state of being rather than an external experience. And I want to stress here at this point that in, in um, Western um, thinking, we, we have a very bifurcated view of reality in which we consider the subjective and the objective to be very different. And we have a sort of inner state of being, which is the subjective and the external is the objective. And when we psychologize things and um, we, we, we sort of are led to say, well, in a sense, this didn't really happen. Are you saying it didn't really happen? It was just a, a, an imagination or a psychological state of being, a, a mental state, a way of thinking about the world. But certainly in the past, and I would suggest we would be enriched if we would slightly lose that bifurcation of thought. This is something real. The, 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 these sources, these Catholic sources, are not saying that shades are not real. They're saying they are real, but they're a state of mind. They're a, a way of, of, of living and viewing and, and perceiving um, the world. So let's just have a look at um, a couple of sources around this topic. And I'm going to share two sources with you. One source is from um, what's called Likutei Maharan, Rav Nachman of Breslov, the famous founder of the Breslov Hasidus, very, very controversial figure, um, who in turn was one of the very strong opponents of the Misnagdim. So we know that Ashkenazi East European Jewry divided into, um, uh, under the influence of the Baal Shem Tov, and more so the Talmudim of the Baal Shem Tov, the, the Magid of Mezrich and his followers, um, split into the Hasidim and those who adopted the name the Misnagdim, the opponents of the Hasidim, what we nowadays call Lithuanian Jewry, or the, the Jewry led by the Vilna Gaon and his followers. And there was a lot of harsh rhetoric both ways around. Um, Rabbi Michael Pollock spoke yesterday in Shul about the uh, Chaim Velozhin, and I think he's going to speak about it in the ladies' Shurim um, series also, um, or has spoken about it. The, uh, um, the topic of uh, the debate and divide between the two is, 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 a, is a very interesting one. But here is a piece from Nachman of Breslov in which he is attacking the Misnagdim, those who um, haven't adopted the insight of Hasidus, and um, through um, so doing, through, through not adopting this insight of Hasidus, um, engage in Torah and Talmud on a very high and advanced level, but tragically and um, significantly, um, don't do so in a, um, in a manner in which they genuinely engage in self-work and self-improvement, and as a result, are not learning Torah lishma. They're not learning Torah with, a, with the most uh, um, sincere um, uh, intentions. Um, they are learning Torah as self-engrandment and self-fulfillment uh, and expression of self, and this isn't Torah lishma. And have a look at uh, what he says over here, um, and I'll just try and share the screen. Um, maybe, Leonard, I can see your face. Can you nod if you can see the shared screen? Excellent. Okay. So this is Seif Likutei Maharan. And he says as follows. Hamisnagdim, the misnagdim, hamavazim vamachrifim yoishamayim, who, who um, uh, insult and um, uh, shame and uh, uh, debase those who are God-fearers. So uh, there are misnagdim, I don't know if he means all misnagdim, but there are misnagdim who shame those who are yoishamayim, in other words, the Hasidim, who genuinely have yoishamayim. So he's puzzled, how can this be? How can it be that great learned Torah scholars behave in an in a immoral way? 
And the answer, Zem Machmas, this is because Shemakablim Terem and Tamida Chomim Shadim Yodon. They learn Terem from Tamida Chomim, who are demons, Jewish demons. Kitamida Chomim Shadim Yodon, Hem Kablim Terosim Yal Shadim. There are Tamida Chomim who are demonic in their behavior, who receive Terem from the Shadim. Sheshem Terem of Fulla. They have a fallen um, Terem, a elf in the Fulin from four fallen um, schools of teaching, um, etc. So the point that uh, Rav Nachman of Resov is saying over here is that one can learn Torah where one learns this from Shadim, from evil sources, rather than learning this from positive forces. Let, let's scroll on a little bit and look at uh, another formulation of this idea and then try and step back and understand what this is saying. And this is a source from the pre tzaddik the famous Rav Tzaddik HaKohen of Lublin, and he cites over here the Ma'aral, and I'm citing it from the secondary source, the Rav Tzaddik HaKohen of Lublin, because he summarizes the Ma'aral and makes it a little bit clearer. And here he references our Gemara itself, the Gemara that we saw in which the Gemara says there were seven Torah teachings that occurred in one yeshiva in Bovel, and that after in the morning, and that afternoon were already being taught in a second yeshiva in Bovel, far away at the other end of the lands of Bovel. And the Gemara in discusses how could they have been communicated from one yeshiva to another yeshiva. And the Gemara answers, maybe this was ADR, and the Gemara says, no, maybe it was Yosef Shitta that, that shared it. So we saw the, the Rambam and others who say that maybe this is a demonic-like human figure, a Tamad Chacham, who doesn't keep halacha. But the Marel psychologizes this, and he says as follows. This is in the bold. I'll just highlight it uh, briefly, just so you can see it. This is in the bold. And now he quotes the Gemara in Erevin, Honey Shev Shmite to this Amru Batsafa Bashabsa, these seven Torah teachings that were said in the morning on Shabbos in one yeshiva, and by the afternoon in another yeshiva. And the Gemara says, How do they get from one to the other? Love Adiyar Amrinu, was it not Adiyar who distributed them? And the one says, No, Dilma Yosef Shid Amrinu, maybe it was Yosef the Shade who distributed them. And now the Maral is bothered. He says, I don't understand. If Adiyar wasn't the base of Medrash, if there was a visitation, a revelation, of the angelic or prophetic figure of ADO in the yeshiva, how come they didn't know? What do you mean? Maybe ADO distributed it. If ADO actually appeared, who appeared to them, how could the more be in doubt whether ADO was there in the base of Medrash and he shared the Torah or not? This is something within themselves, and this is the important line. There was um, expressed in their heart as an internal experience a schadshus in the Torah, who bechinas miskalus adiyahu, equivalent to the revelation of adiyahu. Rak nitzrach mavinus al zesh lefomim mubar mitata hefach yosef shida. But one has to have caution and self insight because sometimes this comes from the opposite, from Yosef the shade. So what, what does this mean? What is this uh, Gemara telling us? What is this moral telling us? It's telling us that when we speak about the revelation of ADO, if we think this is an external experience or always an external experience, we're misunderstanding something. We're missing something. ADO, revelation of ADO, in some form of revelation of the divine, some form of spiritual insight. ADO is the carrier of Torah. The Bible tells us that um, um, ADO, the end of Malachi, he is the person who is um, ADO will appear before the revelation of Mashiach. He will return the hearts of children to their parents and parents to their children. He will um, usher in the era of Mashiach. ADO is the great carrier and teacher of Torah. And we can achieve revelation of ADO. We can have ADR revealed in our life. How does ADR reveal himself? Well, yes, maybe sometimes he reveals himself as an external experience, almost prophet, prophetic-like experience. But at least sometimes, as referenced in the Gemara, it's an internal experience. When one has a, a spiritual insight, an epiphany, a moment of spiritual clarity, a chiddush in Divrei Torah, at that moment we're touching the divine. At that moment we, we're achieving insight and spirituality, and suddenly the world is seen through new colors. Suddenly we have a, an experience of truth and a relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is something new and something different to that which we've had. This is a type of Gilo Yedio. This is a type of revelation of Yedio. And when we, we speak about the idea of a Malach, an angel, we mean an, a, a, whatever an angel exactly means, and we've discussed it before in this forum, it means a, a vehicle for a revelation of awareness of Hashem in our lives. 
Now, there's a certain sort of um, vehicle or awareness of Hashem in our lives, which is labeled the force of Eliyahu. So the Ramam says there's many types of malachim. The wind blowing is a malach of Hashem, is, an, is a messenger of Hashem to create change in the world. The forces of science are messengers or malachim of Hashem to create change in the world. And there is a force of spirituality, which is Eliyahu, a force that allows us human beings to achieve revelation even now in our, our era, distance from the time of Moshiach. Eliyahu is the being who, who um, according to Nach, never died, who continues to be able to transmit and teach Torah, even in this era, who carries on the unbroken chain of Masorah, and we can sometimes access this unbroken chain of Masorah, and that is the revelation of Eliyahu. That is Giloi Eliyahu. This is what we mean by the revelation of Eliyahu, according to this um, thought of Rabbi Kokon, in the way that he understands um, the Maharal. However, says the Maharal, you have to be careful. You have to ask yourself, when you achieve an insight in Torah, is this indeed Eliyahu or Anabi? Or is this Yosef Shittah? God forbid. Is this a thought that comes from a, a, a force of evil? Is this a thought that comes from a lack of clarity, a lack of spirituality, a, a, um, a corrosion in a sense of relationship with Hashem? Not every Chiddush that's innovated is correct. There can be all sorts of agendas and, and ideas that are not in line and authentic with Torah, that one generates from within oneself, and which indeed don't rep represent a genuine uh, a revelation and clarity of thought and spirituality, but God forbid, in the language of moral, represent a tumor and an impurity of thought. So when one has a chitish in Torah, suddenly one achieves a new insight. Suddenly one's looking again at a classic source and thinks, ah, maybe this is what it means. Maybe this is um, the idea that's being expressed. We need to ask ourselves the question, is this a revelation of ADO? Is this, or is this, God forbid, Yosef Shido? Is this the lower and more base and demonic side within our, our psychology, which is coming to the fore? And the Marawa remarkably is learning the Gemara. The Gemara is saying over here, it's not sure. There was this tremendous wave of Chiddush, but what carried the Chiddush onwards? Was it access to ADO? Was it a moment of revelation? Or was it the opposite, God forbid? Was it Yosef Shido? Was it a moment of, of, um, of uh, expression of self and ego or agenda, rather than being a genuine search for Torah. So this is how the Maharal learns this um, source. Now, um, someone uh, posted to me, doesn't the uh, Lutzata, doesn't the Ramchal speak a lot about such beings in the path of the just? Um, he doesn't speak so much about it in the path of the just in Mr. Mr. Shorim, but the Ramchal certainly, and many Kabbalists, spoke about experience of revelation of Torah, via um, what's known in the literature as a mugid, a particular type of angelic revelation, um, which is, uh, which is um, referenced as a mugid because it's an angel that comes to teach Torah. Now, I want to stress over here that it's very, very important to take these sources seriously. Um, we cannot be dismissive of these sources. These sources, as it's true, are expressed by the mystics, by the, by the Kabbalists, um, and, and But these are figures that are absolutely great and central in our Masorah of Torah. Ramchal is a central figure in the Masorah of Torah, and um, he describes such experiences. And remarkably, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, um, who wrote uh, um, the classic halachic work, who had, uh, it doesn't need to be said, had a phenomenal legal and philosophical and rational mind, speaks um, about his uh, experiences of angelic revelation of um, Torah. And by the way, one of the things that I would stress is that unlike um, mystics and other faiths, the great mystics in Judaism have always been figures who are also um, uh, are figures of, of great scholarliness in other areas. There's a, a tremendous um, suspicion of mystics in Yiddishkeit who don't demonstrate mastery over the rational and uh, legal areas of the Torah. So figures of, of mystical significance, like Rabbi Yosef Cairo, like the Vilna Garden, are also figures who have uh, uh, um, written uh, works of philosophy and works of halacha on the first tier, or the first rank. And Rabbi Yosef Cairo is someone who has a, a, a mind that's able, anyone who learns the Beis Yosef and the Shulchan Aruch sees his incredible mastery of all halachic sources and a legal mind that's able to sort them into, into formats and, and conceptualize them. And the same Rabbi Yosef Cairo speaks about his mystical revelations and indeed wrote a sefer, which must be unique in the annals of uh, Jewish thought, the Magid Meisharim, which was a diary of his experiences of Torah taught to him from his uh, from his Magid, from uh, his personal uh, from his personal Magid, the Magid Meisharim, the Torah that the Rabbi Yitzchak learned from the Magid. I should emphasize, by the way, a very fascinating thing. 
which is, first of all, this Maggid was not used in the writing of the Shulchan Aruch. When it came to the writing of the Shulchan Aruch, the Shulchan Aruch sticks, sticks strictly to normal, natural halachic process. And indeed, there are some contradictions between the Torah that was revealed to him through the Maggid and the Torah that um, the Shulchan Aruch Tuscans in the Shulchan Aruch. Very interesting. So when it comes to Shulchan Aruch, when it comes to halacha, um, the, Shul, the, Maggid, the, the Beis Yosef, the Yosef Cairo, follows the classic ways of thinking. When it comes to uh, um, his mystical revelations, he uses the Maggid Meisharim. However, um, the, there is a tradition from a very significant non-Hasidic thinker who also um, understands that this is, in a sense, an internal experience of some sort or other. And this is based on uh, a conversation that someone called Rabbi Yol Kloft had with the Chazan Ish, Rabbi Shari Karelitz. Chazan Ish is the foremost leader of the non-Hasidic world in the early years of, um, in the late years of, of Mandate uh, Palestine, the early years of uh, um, the State of Israel. And he discussed how we can take the views of Rabbi Yosef Cairo, taught to him by a Malach, um, as halacha, surely Torah has to be low bashamayim he. Torah cannot be generated from the heavens, it has to derive from our human understanding of Torah, as we discussed in the previous sub series when we looked at the oral Torah. How can we take the Torah of Rabbi Yosef Cairo, um, uh, taught by the Magid, as of halachic significance? And the Chazanish answered, and he said, uh, Look, the Torah taught to Rabbi Yosef Cairo by the Magid is also Rabbi Yosef Cairo, meaning. Um, it carries the, the import of um, Rabbi Yosef Cairo's understanding of Torah itself. What revelation of Torah does he achieve? That Torah which is given to him from his own unique way of relating and understanding his connection with um, Hashem and with Torah. In the same way as we, each individual, have our own perspective on Torah, certainly the great post can each have their own understanding of Torah, Rabbi Yosef Kari's Maggid reflects his unique spiritual pathway and is generated from within his understanding of Torah. That's also the reason why the opposite approach can't be taken. Why shouldn't we always pass in like the revelation taught to someone through a Maggid? If we take a, a Maggid as a source of Torah, how can we argue with it? If this is what the angel has revealed as the origins of Torah, how can we argue with this source? The answer is this reflects his chilek of Torah, his understanding of Torah, his relationship to spirituality, and therefore other great posts are entitled to have their own connection to spirituality and their own way of relating to Torah. So what have we said so far, and forgive me that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking a little faster than usual because I want to try and finish this topic today, given the, uh, the long gaps that we've had in between. What we've said so far is that there's a very strong school of thought that seem to understand that the use of the language of um, Shadim and ADO and so on, or indeed even mystical experiences like a Magid, a Malach that appears to one in one's, uh, in some form of revelation, are generated from within oneself. In, in other words, and, and, and this is a point I, I, I really want to emphasize, when we speak about the divide between sort of spiritual experiences and mental or psychological experiences and the workings of the mind, we're actually making a mistake. Our mind and our intelligence and our ability to reason is a, is, a, is a route to accessing spiritual truths. If we want to touch spirituality, we, we have a way of so doing. If we want to touch eternity, if we want to achieve insight, if we want to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we have a way of so doing, which is thought and human reason. The, the, the human reason in, in the, the line of thinking of these, these um, scholars, of this school of thought, is not something discrete from a mystical experience, from a prophetic experience, or not solely discrete, but inherent in at least some of these mystical experiences is, is a route to touching the divine through the human ability to think. And in fact, the, the, the language of, of uh, uh, the Kusari and the Rambam, two very different uh, thinkers, is that the Seichel, human reason, is the Malach, is the great angelic um, figure that stands between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If we want to ask, where is the Malach? Where is the angelic spiritual messenger or force that allows us to experience the divine? If we understand Malachim to be messengers of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, forces, created spiritual forces, physical forces, created to, to um, direct and control the world, to be um, uh, pathways through which we humans can interact with the divine and through which the divine can interact with us, then surely the mind and the brain and human reason is one of the great malachim that there are, one of the great angels that there are, one of the great messengers of Hashem to communicate to us and in turn for us to communicate back to him. So this idea of creating a dichotomy 
between a spiritual experience, the revelation of Elio on the side of good, or God forbid, the, the experience of a Yosef Shidduch, of a Yosef the Shade on the side of negativity, to view that as something external to human experience, as something somehow completely different and, and irrational and, and, and um, mystical and removed from the normal workings of the human mind, this is a profound misunderstanding of what we mean by these ideas. This is part of what it means to be a, um, a, human, uh, a human being and to interact and relate to spirituality. Let me try and broaden this discussion a little bit, just to try and uh, make this uh, a, little bit, um, a little bit clearer and uh, to try and understand these concepts within, within a broader um, range. Um, and, and let me use two examples, um, both of them exceptionally sensitive examples. And um, I, the next part of, of what I want to say in the remaining sort of 12 minutes or so it is a little sensitive and, and needs to be understood with care. Um, let me start with, let me try and give two um, examples of this. Um, we speak about Tama and Tara, purity and impurity. And in fact, it's a large part of the Torah um, that there are states of Tuma and states of Tara, both states of purity and states of impurity. Now, now what, what do these terms mean? What, what even is the translation of Tuma and Tara? And, and when does this phenomenon manifest itself? How are we meant to relate to this? So in truth, it's its, whole, it's its own whole subject, its own whole topic. But as pointed out by the Or HaChaim, and as pointed out by Samson Raphael Hirsch, Tumor is always associated with an absence of life. Um, a human being was alive, and now there is an absence of life. There is a Cholol, which translates as a corpse, but also is linked etymologically to Chalal, a vacuum. There's a loss of life. Tumor is associated with that. Um, lesser forms of Tumor are associated with lesser losses of life whether the death of an animal, which is a lower level of tumor, an avela is an alpha tumor, the death of the cessation of life in an animal, which was also a life force, whether it's saras, which is a leprosy, a, a death of part skin or parts of the body, so is chash of kames, it's a mini form of death, whether it is the loss of potential life as indicated by the monthly cycle and uh, the, the experience of, of the breakdown of the uh, womb that was preparing itself for potentially carrying life, whether this is post-birth, postpartum, um, and therefore a, a, a mother was carrying a child within herself, and now the child has left, and there is the vacuum within the mother. Um, in all these cases of tumor, this is associated with the cessation of life or the loss of potential of life. Now, the, there's a profound um, point um, being brought out by this Arachim. And, and I, to understand it, I, I, I'm not suggesting this is everything that there is to be understood about Tuma and Tara, but it's certainly a, a way of relating to it. Thus, what is the translation of Tuma and Tara? So we translate it as purity as impurity, but like many translations in English, we, we've lost sight of the original meaning of the word. Um, Tara means clarity. That which is pure is clear. It's not murky, it's not mixture, it's not um, mixed, it's not liquid, which has sediment within it. It's tahar, it's pure and it's clear. And that's what we mean by the word purity. Impurity, tuma, means a murkiness and a cloudiness and a lack of clarity and a lack of uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, a, a mixture, a, a liquid which has sediment within it, a cloudiness is what's referred to as tuma. So the literal translation of tuma and tara, which is translated as pure and impure, but we hear it's something mystical, literally means that which is pure and clarified and clear versus that which is murky and impure and non-clarified and, and mixed up. So one aspect of understanding the concept of tuma and tara is that with the cessation of life, comes a cloudiness, a lack of clarity of thought. We're overwhelmed, we're confused, we're unable to process what we're thinking, we're unable to think clearly. Now it's important to stress that nowhere in the Torah does it say that tuma is a, a, a bad or evil thing. It simply, in fact, there's no issa to be tome. The prohibition to be tome is if I wish to enter the base of Mikdash, if I wish to eat truma, if I wish to eat a carbon, if I wish to engage in certain types of kadusha, then I can't be Tomei in so doing. If I'm a Koyen whose role is to serve in the base of Mikdash, in the point of sanctity, then I can't do that when I'm in a state of Tumor. In other words, a prerequisite for kadusha is a, is, a, is a clarity, is a Tahara, isn't this state of confusion and murkiness. 
trauma is not a bad thing. It's a part of the condition of life. All of us have to go through processes and times of trauma. This is part of the natural condition of life. Bereavement, loss, rebirth. These aren't negative experiences in and of themselves. It's certainly not evil experiences. It's certainly not um, bad experiences or, or, or um, sinful experiences. They're simply the part of life. And sometimes, in fact, sometimes they're positive experiences. Childbirth is a, a positive experience, a, 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 a bracha. It's something good, something positive. However, with them goes a state of lack of clarity a certain sense of loss, a certain sense of confusion. Bereavement in, in its most extreme form is certainly associated with a cloudiness and a lack of clarity of, um, of vision. And even positive experiences like childbirth, there's a certain sense of letting go of a loss. Every time a, a child grows a little older, the first time a child toddles off to school, parents feel a great sense of joy that the child has reached that stage, but it's also a certain sense of letting go. When a child goes off to, to leave home and goes off to yeshiva, sends university, leaves home for the first time, forever a child, a parent feels a great joy that this is happening, that sense of loss. Under the chuppah, parents are delighted and, and happy, and it's a moment of simcha, but also it's a moment of accepting that one needs to let go. So the process of, of letting go, of moving on to the next stage, can be a process associated with this cloudiness of vision, with this confusion, which takes time to clarify as one works through the Tahara process and then emerges back into clarity. In this moment of Tumma, in this moment of lack of clarity, one isn't able to engage with Kedusha. One isn't able to step forward to the next stage because there's a confusion of thought. It, clarity of thought is considered in our thinking to be a, a, a state which is necessary for us to, to reach out to the divine, for us to engage with a, 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 with a uh, um, experience of Kedusha in the fuller sense. Does one always need to engage? No, there's part of the reality of life is sometimes a stage of tumult. That, that is part of what it means to be a human being. It's not a negative experience, it's simply a reality of a, a stage that we need to go through. So, so tumma is associated with this lack of clarity of thought. I'm not going to go now through, through the, the ritual of becoming Tahar, of emerging from Tumma, other than to point something out that's absolutely remarkable, which is the chayk of all chukim, the biggest mystery of all existence, is, of, of all um, mitzvahs, is the parah Duma, the ritual associated with emerging from the deepest level of Tumma possible, the loss of a close relative, of becoming Tommy Mace, and emerging from that experience. The mitzvah, which is the greatest mystery of human existence, is also parallels, the, the mitzvah, which is the greatest mystery of all of the Torah, parallels the greatest mystery of human existence. The great mystery of human existence is what are we human beings? How can it be that we feel eternal, we feel immortal, that we have a rich inner life, that we are conscious beings who are here on earth, and yet we inhabit a physical body, and yet one day we, we, we will cease to be, one day we will die. What, what is human existence, and what, what of us remains after that? What is consciousness, and how do we relate to the gift of being alive and, and, and in physical. Our death is by definition mysterious and concealed from us. None of us can conceive ultimately of a, a world that continues to exist when we are not in existence or a world indeed that existed before we were in existence. The greatest mystery at the heart of, of the sort of existential angst that all of us should feel as human beings, the, the, the drive to strive to spirituality and meaning and purpose is to resolve this paradox that we feel on the one hand we can touch immortality, we can touch infinity, we can achieve things of absolute worth, and on the other hand, we're here today and gone tomorrow. So the greatest mystery of human existence parallels the halachic and mitzvah greatest mystery of the resolution of this conflict. The resolution of the conflict, of the, conclu of the confusion of trauma, of this lack of clarity of thought that loss and bereavement creates in us, is the paradoma, is, 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 is the mitzvah which is the greatest mystery of all. So there's a parallel, which mitzvah would one expect to be the greatest chok, the least understandable of all? The mitzvah which represents the great chok of human existence, the mystery of what it means to be alive. So all avedus, all bereavement, all loss is associated with confusion. And anyone who's been through the difficult experience of loss knows this. Long before one goes to grieving, one goes to confusion. Everything is, is overwhelming, it's confusing. I don't know where I'm going with this. I thought I saw a path in life, and now I can no longer see where I am. I no, I no longer know how, 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 how to proceed. That the future is, is hidden from me. It's, 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 um, it's, it's concealed, it's, it's unclear, as per the meaning of the word uh, tumma. In that, the, the, the emotional expression of, of this confusion that we experience is, is tears. 
we, we cry, our vision becomes blurred, our, we have a lack of clarity about where we're going. Demo is tears, demo means confusion, the literal meaning of the word demo, demo ops, tears, means a blurring of vision. Our vision and our clarity becomes confused, and the process of healing from this is tara, is a clarification. Says, the, says these Hasidic thinkers that this is what we mean by, by shadim. This is one insight into understanding what a shade means. Where do we associate shadim? Where does the Gemara tell us about the existence of shadim? In a pit, where one hears a voice coming out, in a deserted and haunted house. What do we feel when we enter this deserted and haunted house? We, we cease to think clearly. We cease to be completely rational. That which is irrational within us, that which is, is confusing within us, that piece which is, that part of us which is fearful when we begin imagining sights and sounds that don't actually exist, when, when we almost hallucinate and cease to be completely rational, this is what the Gemara says is the moment when shades and appear. This is the, the moment when we experience a, a lack of clarity in our thought and needs to be wary of shadim. So uh, we're running out of time, but the parting thought over here, the thought shared with us by the Me'iri, by um, uh, Reb of Lublin, by I should have mentioned, and uh, this is a source I, I can share with you off group, Reb Aaron uh, Soloveitchik, the brother of uh, Rav Soloveitchik in a, a, a wonderful book he wrote called Logic of the Heart, Logic of the Mind, um, and many other thinkers, is that the experience of demons, of shading, refers to uh, the irrational side within us human being, the part of the side within us which is clouded in its thinking, which doesn't um, have a clarity of thought, which is in a state of tumor of impurity. Um, what is the Gemara telling us? The Gemara is telling us that when we have an insight, as Rav Tzadok HaKon of Rublin tells us, we need to ask ourselves, is this a moment of revelation of Eli or Anovi? Is this com something coming from the spiritual within us? Is this something coming from the force of good? Or is this Yosei Shida, this is the part of within ourselves which is less rational, less clear thinking, and therefore less able to access Kedusha. When we enter a place of shade and place of demons in this line of thought, we shouldn't be scared of the external demons that may be attacking us. We should realize that within ourselves, that which is irrational comes to the fore, that which is fearful, that which is hallucinatory, that which imagines um, sounds and sights which creates a fear within us, and that which therefore makes us afraid, and at that point, we need to reconnect ourselves like a shrug, to clarity of thought and to behaving with seichel and reason. Um, I've run out of time there, so I'll stop. Uh, um, I apologize for a little bit of a rush in this last session, which really should have been split into two. But I wanted to finish off the topic of shading, given the significant uh, delay and gap in this series. And in the next week, we'll start a new topic. I'm open to suggestions, um, though I have quite a full list from people that have emailed me over time. In the meantime, I, I wish you all a good morning and thank you so much, as always, for joining oh, me. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.